Welcome to the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. We hope you enjoy the following quick take on international affairs while we all wait out the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joan Zarnecki. I'm a professor with the Naval War College here in Monterey. I teach a subject called joint operations, but I've been professionally interested in globalization and governance and social change for decades. In this quick take on globalization, governance and change, I'm gonna try and talk with you uh, about what's going on in the world. I've got a small slideshow uh, that visualizes what I'm going to be talking about. The first thing that I need to tell you is that the views that you hear are my own and not those of the Department of Defense or the Department of the Navy. The second thing I need to tell you is that I'm terrifically uncomfortable and suffering from stage fright. So this is like take 17 for me, even though I've been thinking about this presentation for the last, oh, three and a half months since I received the invitation from the World Affairs Council. So I'm going to try and present this as if I'm having a conversation with you. And I'm telling one of my very famous shaggy dog stories. If you run into my students, they'll roll their eyes and tell you about them. So consider this one more shaggy dog story. A lot of the information that I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes is based upon some pretty sophisticated social science uh, research. We don't have the time to go into the background on all of the theories that I'm amalgamating here, but if you want, you can invite me back for a long take rather than a quick take, and I can uh, dive into these theories. So, want to know what's going on? Follow me to the slides. Now, this is my original title, and it's rather pompous if you really think about it. Uh, this is really what I want to talk about and what's going on here. And I'm old enough now to have enough experience under my belt to be able to place a little bit of the context. We live in interesting times, that's for darn sure. And how did everything get so screwed up? When 20 years ago, we were near the top of our game, and now everything seems to be disintegrating around us. What the hell is going on? Well, the start of the story, actually, I think it helps to do a little time travel. Let's go back to 1950, not that long ago. It's about two years after I'm born. And uh, since I'm talking, I'm going to take you to where I was at two years old, which was Bayside, Queens, borough of New York City. And I want you to think about New York City in 1950. It is a hub of global manufacturing, global trade, and global finance. I can remember the docks being so busy on New York and Brooklyn and on the New Jersey uh, waterfront, filled with goods coming and going, Railroad trains bringing the goods from across the land to the docks, and off they go, and in they come. The pulse of a nation, the pulse of a globe. All of the infrastructure, the docks, the railroads, the roads, 
the buildings all provided by uh, a society that is organized through a government, which is the almost literal definition of what governance is. And we're getting along, uh, pretty much. Uh, our ethnic groups are stovepiped and uh, living together, but separately, if you will. On my block on 207th Street in Bayside, Queens, uh, we were pretty much Central European. Next block over, mostly Jewish. On the other side of 48th Avenue, mostly African American. We would meet on places of community interest, ball fields, and interact there. Things seemed to be uh, pretty interesting, pretty vibrant. If I wanted culture, we had movie houses, we had Broadway, and the shows all seemed to be reinforcing a unity of our identity as a nation state, that is the United States of America. Our military in 1950 was rebuilding because the war in Korea had caught us in a demobilized state. We wouldn't make that mistake again of going uh, to a demobilized state after Korea, and we would stay mobilized for until now, uh, effectively, throughout the entire Cold War, but we never demobilized in the wake of the Cold War. And our military uh, quickly became as confident as it was at the end of World War II. And we've stayed pretty confident throughout the decades since. Now let's fast forward the little time machine and go to 2020. And here we are. I'm in Spreckles right now. I can hear the, both the birds as well as the farm equipment outside my window right over here. Spreckles, by the way, is a very small, 475 houses, about a thousand of us Spreckle aliens, who knows, uh, living here. We're a little south of Salinas and a little east of most of you watching this video on the Monterey Peninsula. We're a little town. This is our main street, and it only has one side. This is it. That's the store, that's the post office, uh, that's the volunteer uh, fire department. We have a real nice park, and yet we are a center of globalization. Right across the street from our main street is this. This is Tanamora and Antel, which is a global agribusiness. We hear and see the trade, processing, transport of agricultural products from all over the Salinas Valley, going to places like China, India, Kazakhstan, Europe, South America, the South Pacific, every day, 24 hours a day, across a varied infrastructure, mostly roads, but there is one very, very functioning railroad that runs a little bit north of here as well. They go to the ports of San Francisco, and even more so, they fly out of San Jose, uh, a little out of Salinas and Monterey, so that the agricultural goods are fresh 
to the places that want them. It is a fantastic setup. And as for now, we, our groups, our social ethnic groups in Spreckles anyway, is pretty well integrated now. And we're a, we're a nice bunch of people. We throw a heck of a 4th of July party when there's no pandemics around. And we also have this. You'll recognize this, we all have one. I tell my students, who are all military officers uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School, this is the most powerful weapon system in the world. This weapon system has taken down nation states. That's something that no aircraft carrier, no division of tanks, no squadron of advanced fighter aircraft or bomber aircraft has ever done. And smartphones are affordable. This one, Android G7, cost me 350 bucks. As opposed to an aircraft carrier, that's about 15 to 17 billion dollars minus the airplanes or a division of tanks, which is several tens of millions of dollars. Or aircraft like the F-35, which uh, will run you about 350 to 400 million dollars per plane. And there are 18 planes in a squadron. This, provides me almost infinite access to any information I want. Compare that to 1950, to New York City, which is the global center for commerce, for trade, for finance. At that time, we have AM radio, a lot of stations, but very narrow then. We have Newspapers, lots and lots of newspapers, all types of newspapers, morning newspapers, evening newspapers, afternoon newspapers. They're slow, very slow. Before you find out something has happened in the world, it's going to be at least 24 hours. And oh yes, we have this new thing, TV. We have channels two, we have channel four, we have channel five, we have channel seven, we have channel nine, we have channel 11, which is the local channel, and we have channel 13, which is some new thing called public TV. Nobody watches it in 1950. Compare that again with what you get here. Streaming video, YouTube, uh, Netflix is on here. Uh, Disney Plus is access stream between my computer and this, this is a computer. The big change between 1950 and 2020 lies in the difference in how we get our information. And therein lies a key element of the story. Let's go back to the slides. I'm gonna give you a very simplified possibly oversimplified model of how what I'm talking about here. Spreckles or New York City or the United States or the globe are made up of a collection of social identities. Here you've got the definition of, all of them. And it's uh, you know, how we as individuals think of ourselves as a group. And if you think about it, We've got several social identities. I'm a citizen of the United States. I'm also a citizen of California. I'm also a citizen of Monterey County. And I sure as heck am a citizen of Spreckles. But that's not all. I'm also a member and I, you know, I'm president of the Board of Trustees. That's kind of like a real important member of my church, the Unitarian Universalist Church in the Monterey. Uh, peninsula. 
I also have another social identity. I'm a husband. I'm part of a family, a nuclear family structure. I have sons. I have daughters. I have grandchildren. You see that social identities, groups depend upon how we identify, how we identify ourselves. They are vital for humans to construct and maintain society. If you have a healthy social identity, you're likely to have a, so a, like, a healthy social entity. Now, what are the dynamics that affect this? Well, the first thing is social identities have a mix of forces that push or pull themselves together. Um, they can be understood as cultural, economic, political, and this military is really a subset of political. Well, let's just call it four. Now, the real dynamics come from two pieces. The first one being trust. How much do I trust you? How much do you trust me? If we have a reasonable sense of trust, then what happens is, is that we can conduct social transactions. I give you a dollar, you give me half dozen eggs, which actually does happen here in Spreckles on a routine basis. We have lots of local chicken coops. If I don't trust you, then I'm likely to be suspicious of your behavior. It's about that time, if I become suspicious of my neighbors, that uh, I have to travel to Hunter's Supply, pick up my long rifle, pick up my revolver, and prepare for uh, Armageddon. I haven't done that, and neither has my wife. Although because of larger things that are happening in our society, the discussion has come up. Well, here's the oddball. Information. Now, I've made this simple. And if you look at this, you say, okay, we have just a two-way. You know, social trust is, uh, if you will, centripetal force driving together and helps improve uh, greater social trust, greater social identity. More information uh, undercuts that. And so you have a real simple understanding as to what is happening because we move to virtually unlimited uh, information access. But it's not that simple. Let me show you a very simplified graph of how information affects us individually and our social identities. I know this is a little bit uh, sciency, um, but bear with me. What we're looking at here is how we process information. Output over input, nothing else. But you'll notice that some information, as I increase information, uh, okay, I can, uh, the information that I receive is converted to output. I can handle the information. I can understand the information and act on that information. But there becomes a point at which we reach diminishing returns and more input doesn't result in as much output. At some point, that actually turns and collapses. This, as we're going to see, is the point of information overload. This doesn't affect just people. This affects groups. This affects larger organizations like governance systems, like the global governance system. If you have too much information, it can work against you. Now, one thing we know is those those social identities that have large amounts of social trust, you can stretch out the effects of, uh, you can delay the effects of social, uh, of information overload. We call this a degree, uh, we in social science 
call us a degree of social resilience. But you'll notice the red line here. Invariably, if you don't do something about the management of information, the effect on the system uh, or social identity, however, nation state, uh, community group, you name it, the effect is pretty much uh, irreversible. The system will collapse, become paralyzed, or have to regenerate itself in some other way. Too much information. I could give you so many cases from my professional specialty, which is war, as well as from the corporate world, as well as from the social world. And it's illustrated over, has been illustrated time and time again. I'll bet if you think about it, you can think about cases. This can happen even to families. There is such a thing really as DMI, too much information. Cognitive scientists have studied it. We can actually put a number on how much information we can get. The real insidious thing here is that more information, that more complex groups, rather, can process more information, but they do it slowly. So different sized groups will have different shaped curves, but all of them will reach a point of no return and begin the inevitable process of collapse. There are things that you can do about this. Social identities, by the way, to explain the word, what the heck is a living system? Um, I probably should have called that ways that social identities. Uh, living system is a technical social psychology term. It describes anything that is matter and energy organized by information. It stretches all the way down to the cellular level up to and including supranational organizations like multinational corporations and the United Nations. Living systems, social identities, have figured out ways to deal with information overload, to delay, to control, to squelch uh, them. Uh, cognitive scientists have identified eight of them. The problem with all eight is they lead to distorted responses. They lead to, for example, under chunking and escape and filtering, they lead to polarization. Instead of having that common ball field that we had back in 1950 to go play on and interact with our different uh, eth ethnicities, uh, we had build our own ball field where just our kind can play. And the result is a distortion in the larger social identity called Bayside Queens, in, in that case, if that were to happen. And the problem is, is that it doesn't seem to stop. We are increasing the amount of information that our national social identity uh, can take. And we're not the only ones. Every other nation in the world is having the same problem. Let me show you a piece of information that illustrates this. This is just from politics. This is the Pew Center uh, for Research uh, Evidence in terms of polarization of uh, Democrats and Republicans. Now, I'm a political scientist, so I'm very, very familiar with uh, the overlapping curves. We used to be a nation of consensus. You see this circle in 1994? 
that looks very much like the circle in 1948 when the first uh, questions on this were posed by the University of Michigan to the American electorate. Now, the reason why 2004 is interesting is because 2004 looks very much like 1994, but something big has happened between 94 and 2004. This is the explosion of the internet. So up until now, in 1994, yeah, we have TV, we have cable TV, uh, we have radio, AM and FM, uh, we still have lots of newspapers. We have uh, lots of other ways of uh, social gathering, ball fields, bowling alleys, things like that, where we all gather together and cross our paths. And we have a consensus on how the world works. That's that purple consensus. It's still there in 2004. But look what happens 10 years on. It looks like somebody took a you know, 75 millimeter shell and shot it right through that consensus. It's mostly empty. People have retreated. The consensus is significantly less. What has happened? What was the big change here? It doesn't can't be the internet. The internet didn't have that much of an effect. Something else did. This then. What is this? This is just a piece of hardware. That's what's on here. On my machine, it's Twitter. If you go see my wife's machine, it's Facebook. In short, what has happened here between 2004 and 2014 is the rise and flooding like a fire hydrant, water coming from a fire hydrant of social media. And that has led to our polarization. That has led, and it's not just here. Facebook has what? Three billion members worldwide. Twitter has what? 1.8 billion members worldwide. And we've got to remember that there's a little over 7 billion of us Homo sapiens on the, on the globe. So that's pretty significant market penetration right there. What appears to be happening across the board is that our social identities are being fractured. Let me show this one more time in a time travel kind of thing. Uh, this information is based, by the way, if you're interested in going back, on Michael Mann, who a uh, famous historical sociologist who writes the so sources of social power four volumes you better be very serious if, about understanding this stuff if you want to go there but he traces uh the sources of social power those sources of social identity politics military economics and culture being driven by information and he takes a look at the different periods i've Simplify this into two. The first one, 13th to 16th centuries, these are the precursors to nation states. And we see historical dynamics, but to quote, to quote Mel Brooks, it's good to be king back then. Because you are the biggest trader, you are the representative of the globe, uh, you define the culture, and you're the general in charge of your own uh, forces, and uh, you definitely are the uh, arbiter. You're the chief judge. Good. King is being good. Now, at the same time, information is growing, but trust is very high. Uh, trust in the king and trust in God. And in the 13th and 16th centuries, if you're growing up in the West, 
That God is a Roman Catholic God. We have almost equilibrium conditions here in terms of our social identities. There isn't a whole heck of a lot of change, but you will recall from your history, something is going on here. And that concerns this bubble, information. This is the beginning of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. People are asking questions. And this is the period where we get a brand new method of mass communication. It's called the printing press. And this will revolutionize this convergence of concentric circles, making it good to be king. Compare that with now. We have a heck of a lot more information. And what has it done? It's driven us into our own little groups. And indeed, we have people who are mostly interested in economics, Wall Street. We have people who are interested in uh, culture, for example, Hollywood, uh, artists in general. Um, we have people who are interested in politics, the swamp in Washington. And of course, we also have that subset, uh, the military, who in our country, are, we are fortunate to have a very strong civil military ethic in which the military defers to their civilian leaders. But that's not completely a given. What's happened here is, as you read at the bottom, information is unstable and unpredictable. Trust is breaking down on my block on 207th Street. Trust is breaking down in Spreckles. Uh, trust is breaking down across the country. We have flyover country, and we have the left coasts, both the east and the west coast. Uh, and really, on the East Coast, it's only part of the East Coast. All these phenomena are being driven by information overload, information that's reinforcing what we want to believe. All of this adjusting to the phenomenon of too much information. Information is that genie that has gotten out of the bottle. And in our case, what I fear is that the bottle can't catch the genie anymore. So from here on in, I'm going to be uh, giving you a speculation. And it's for you to decide whether uh, it's a good beginning or is it just a questionable ending. I don't think we can put that genie of information back in the bottle. And I think we're going to fracture. <clears throat> we are going to be uh, subject to far more information. And our communities of interest, our intent, our social identities will become parochial. Social trust will become far more redefined and reduced. We need social trust, though as human beings, because we are relational beings. We need society. It's how we have evolved. It's hardwired into us. It's just that what kind of society, what kind of social identity would evolve? There are choices. We could be highly competitive, like the hill tribes of Scotland or Papua New Guinea. Uh, uh, conflict, war, uh, competition, uh, thrive in those conditions, or we can be collaborative or cooperative like the Southwest tribes of, uh, of indigenous peoples in America or New England uh, town or village uh, villages, uh, which still to this day retain a lot of that very localized um, social identity.
not only is it the type, but also the how. You can think that human governance, which provides the means by which social identity can evolve, be healthy or unhealthy, facilitate information or turn it off, is our governance, okay, now being subjected to the whims of nature, is it directional in which we think it's only going to go in one direction, progress and growth? And at this time, given the fact that we seem to have fallen off a cliff, uh, you have to question what does that mean in terms of progress and growth? Or is it regenerative? The model on the right is uh, one called panarchy, and I can give an entire another quick take on just the concept of panarchy. It's a social ecological theory, which says that systems never really go away. The, they either revolt or remember, and they either get bigger to larger scale, more inclusive and diverse uh, communities, or they reduce themselves to smaller, less inclusive, less diverse uh, side, but they're still there. It's just uh, how they're going to progress in the future. I have no answers for you. I have just questions, and I hope this has provoked you in a good way to think about what is going on in the world and in your communities. It is going on. The future is not faded. I've given you one look. I can almost guarantee you it won't be the look. But definitely change is upon us. We live in interesting times. And just because I live in a wonderful little village like Spreckles, and you live in your wonderful communities throughout the Monterey uh, Peninsula, doesn't mean we will be isolated from the forces that are tearing us apart. I hope you've enjoyed this quick take. This is John Zarnicki. If you want to have any contact information, I have one more slide for you. If you want to discuss with me any of the ideas I've presented in this uh, quick take, here they are. And with that, I'll conclude my little talk and go back to enjoying the morning here in Spreckles, California, where we're always friendly. Goodbye now.